of you joining us online. We're so thankful to have each of you here as well. Um, we wanted to start off the service with a uh, few verses from Psalms. Um, they'll be up on the screen as well, so you can just follow along uh, in your head silently. Um, and feel free to just stay seated, uh, just listen for the words. <clears throat> this is Psalm 148, verses 1 through 13. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the skies. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all the armies of heaven. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you twinkling stars. Praise him, skies above. Praise him, vapors high above the clouds. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. Praise the Lord from the earth, you creatures of the ocean depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, wind and weather that obey him, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all livestock, small scurrying animals and birds, kings of the earth and all people, rulers and judges of the earth, young men and young women, old men and children. Let them all praise the name of the Lord, for his name is very great. His glory towers over the earth and heaven. So the reason why we wanted to start off with that verse this morning was because uh, the first song we're going to sing together is All Creatures of Our God and King, an oldie but a goodie. And it was written many years ago inspired by those particular verses in Psalms. So if you could stand and join us, and we're going to start this morning off singing. Sing all creatures. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with the sea.
just love to take us through that chorus again. And there's something so special we're going to learn about today. It's we are the church. We are the church. And so can we just change that language from me to us and just sing this together as one body of believers as our frontline family. Let's just sing it one more time together. Oh, Christ be magnified. church to one another today. So we're just going to take a moment and we're going to spend some time in prayer together. So would you find someone to the right of you or the left of you, behind you, in front of you? Just find someone. We're going to have a countdown timer up on the screen and just a single question for you to ask each other. If you don't know each other, share your name and then ask each other this question and um, you can just spend two, two and a half minutes in prayer. So go ahead, throw that question up, and let's head into some prayer time. Okay, our time, our time is up. If you didn't get to finish praying, find them after service and just continue that prayer time. Um, we believe that God is mighty and holy and above all things. You can have a seat. And we believe that God is a healer. And um, we believe that God is a healer so much that we are having a worship night. Um, and the emphasis for that worship night on November 8th is worship, prayer, and healing. And so we would just invite you um, to come out to that on November 8th. It's gonna be right here in the worship center. And just as our ministry lead teams um, 
leaders have sat together and just prayed and discerned what the Lord has for this night, there was just that healing. Healing was just the main theme. And so we're so excited um, just to approach God in faith, um, knowing that his will is above ours, but we can also ask for healing and be expectant for what he can give. And so we just invite you to come out for that in just a couple weeks, a couple short weeks away. And also today, just as we talk about being the church, um, we're offering our core membership class today um, during the 11 o'clock service. And so right after the service, if you want to participate in that, I would really encourage you to do that. Maybe you've been coming to Frontline for a while, but you haven't become an official member, or maybe you're new and you just have questions about doctrine, what we believe, um, and you just have some questions, that is a great place to go. When you attend, you're not actually signing up to become a member. Um, you can choose after that class if you want to become a member or not. And so um, very low pressure, we would just invite you to um, just step into that, um, whether you've been coming here for a while or just a short time. And lastly, um, I just wanted to share a scripture with you. Um, this is from 2 Samuel 2, 20, uh, sorry, 24. And um, this scripture really stuck out to me a couple weeks ago. And I just want to read it for us. So, Arana said to David, let my Lord, the King, take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering and here are threshing sledges and yo ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arana gives all this to the King. And Arana also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But King David replied to Arana, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So the context of this is David is getting ready to make a sacrifice to the Lord and David understood worship. He understood sacrifice. We see that all through scripture. He wrote a lot of the Psalms, just praises to the Lord. He danced before the Lord. He was a king, he had great wealth, resources, power. And so this other guy approaches him and says, here, like, I know you're about to make a sacrifice to the Lord on the altar. Here's everything you need. And David was like, wait a minute. I will not give something to the Lord that costs me nothing. And so I think sometimes with, with offering, with tithes, we play it safe a little bit. You know, we have an extra dollar in our pocket that we're not going to use, so that's good enough. But worship requires sacrifice. And if our giving is sacrifice, or if our giving is worship, it requires sacrifice. And so a tithe is 10% of what you make, what you, you generate for your income. An offering is above and beyond that. And so whatever situation you're in, we all have something to sacrifice. We all have something to bring to the Lord. Um, my husband and I recently bought a house. So now we have a mortgage and that's really scary. And so the Lord is just testing my faith. He's testing my worship and my sacrifice to him by saying, are you still gonna give me 10%? Are you still gonna go above and beyond and sacrifice even though your bank account is looking a lot lower these days? So let's all give, let's all sacrifice to the Lord what he is due. Let's give to him what costs us something. Let's pray together and as we take this offering and then David's gonna bring the word. So pray with me. God, we love you. It's an honor, it's a joy to worship you, to sacrifice, Lord. I just pray over this room, Lord, that a heart of worship would be stirred up in us, that we would recognize our great need of you, of your power, and that our security cannot be found in the money that we see in our bank account. Lord, I even pray for those who have resources other than money that need to be given, whether that's time or um, emotional attention or their home, Lord, their space. I pray that we would all sacrifice to you and be obedient to you, Lord, what you're asking of us. So please be with David as he brings the message this morning. Help us to be receptive to what your Holy Spirit is saying. We'll give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, 
Amen. Well, good morning, Frontline. It's just good to see all of you. It's also good to have you if you're joining and watching online. Uh, we are in the middle of a series right now. We're actually going to wrap it up next week. And you saw the video here before that sets it up. It's called Anchored. And we've been talking about different things that we actually uh, are called to and created to anchor our lives to as followers of Jesus. So the first week that we talked about this, this was all about our identity in Jesus, that every one of these acres are designed to point us and attach us to and reflect us and, and direct our attention towards anchoring ourselves in the actual person of Jesus. And so we did fasting. We talked about fasting. Last week we talked about prayer. And today, as Carol Ann just mentioned, we're talking about the church and the church as an anchor. But I want to read this passage that this whole series is built on again. And it's found in Hebrews. And it goes like this. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. So as we talk about anchors, these anchors are designed to move us somewhere, and it's to move us towards the person of Jesus. That's the focus. That's the, the point of every single one of these that we're talking about. So as we talk about the church, I want to take you to one of the most exciting moments in the Bible of the early church. I mean, I wish, if there was a moment in the entire Bible that I wish I was alive for, that I could have seen play itself out, it would be this scene. And it takes place in Acts chapter 1, and it's a build-up to what is called Pentecost. So a few days earlier, the resurrected Jesus, so if that gives you a timeline, Jesus uh, led ministry, and he did ministry for three and a half years. He was with his disciples. He was building up to the cross. He was betrayed. He was handed over. He was nailed to a cross, died. Three days later, he rose again from the grave, and then he spent 40 days with his disciples, and it was right at the end of that time. It was like that 40th day. He's looking at his disciples, this group of people, probably 120. He's looking at all of them and he says, it is better for you to stay here, stay in Jerusalem because I have a gift for you that you need. You need. And the gift is called the Holy Spirit. So I want you to stay here and you wait in Jerusalem until you receive that gift. And so what it says is a couple days later, there they all were. They were in Jerusalem and the sound of a rushing wind, I mean, flew right through the city center, right through the streets. It came on and it says tongues of fire separated and it rested on all of the apostles and they began speaking and they spoke in tongues. Another interpretation of that is they spoke in different languages to the point that everybody around them was paying attention. Everybody around them was listening. And they went, aren't these men from a specific, like they're from Galilee, aren't they? Like they, they all should speak the same language. Why do we hear them all speaking in different languages totally clearly? And it was because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So it kind of focuses on one of the characters in particular in the book of Acts, and his name is Peter. And Peter's one of my favorite disciples because Peter gets in trouble all the time. I like that. I can relate. He, he has a foot that he inserts into his mouth over and over and over. He says the wrong thing all the time. And I go, I can relate to that. I have said so many wrong things at the wrong time for the wrong situation, bad timing for jokes. You know what I mean? So Peter, I can relate to Peter. Here's what happens with Peter is Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, gets out in front of this group, right? This, this loud wind and, and the rush, like I picture a freight train that just barrels through. All of these people gather and they're wondering, what is going on right now? And Peter, right, Mr. Foot in his mouth, Peter steps up and he goes, I want to talk to you guys for a second and I want to explain something to you. And he preaches the gospel. And he says, this is what it means to follow Jesus. And this is who he was. And this is why he died. And this is why you need a relationship with him. And the passage says, it cut the people to the heart. And they repented. And it says, they baptized 3,000 people in one day. 
This, if you were there, if you were watching this take place and you saw this movement and the people responding with weeping and people giving their lives and sacrifice, the people that you went, there's no way redemption will ever come to that house or that person. When you see this happen, the question you would ask is, how did this whole thing start? That's what I want to back up to. I want to rewind just a little bit. We're going to go back a couple weeks, and there's a really important conversation that Jesus has with his disciples about starting the church. And here's what it looks like. This is in Matthew chapter 16. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He's talking about himself. Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Jesus chose this particular place on purpose. If you don't know much about Caesarea Philippi, you're in good company. I don't either. I did a little homework on it and a little bit of study, and here's what I found. If you want to talk about Caesarea Philippi, it was mainly populated by Gentiles. So Jesus was Jewish, and all of his, or most of his disciples, I should say, were Jewish. But Jesus withdrew from this land where most of them are Jewish, and he went to a non-Jewish place a non-Jewish city that had different gods and different religions and different focuses and family dynamics and societal priorities. He went to a place that was totally different. And in that place that he was there, there was this great temple of white marble built to the godhead of Caesar. And it's in this place and in this setting that Jesus looks at his disciples, these guys that have followed him now for three and a half years. They know him well. They've listened to him teach. They've seen him preach. They've watched him heal people. They've seen and they've been present for the miracles. It's in this setting now, totally removed from the safety net and the comfort of what they're used to. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And so they respond. Some of them say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, you know, some say one of the prophets. And Jesus goes, okay, now you guys have been close. Who do you say that I am? Who am I? And Peter speaks up and he goes, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the one that's been promised to our people for centuries. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one that we've anticipated. And Jesus goes, you are so blessed right now. Because I, I didn't reveal that to you. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. It's this special moment and this powerful moment. But then Jesus says these words, and this is why we still gather today. It's why the church is still around today. It's why the church will be around to the day that Jesus comes back. These words that Jesus says right here. And he goes, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here's the backdrop. It's the world's religions and the world's power authorities and the world's idols and the world's focuses, and Jesus uses that as a backdrop. And he goes, you see all this other stuff? You see all the directions that, that go after people's hearts? You see all the things that people are tempted to anchor themselves to? And he goes, I want to be compared to that. This is the setting that I chose. I'm going to contrast what the world offers, what the world is leading you to, what the world cares about. I'm going to contrast the world at its best compared to me. It's nothing. He goes, I am Jesus. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. But he says these four things in here that stick out. I mean, they jump off the page, and it's why I want to work through them real quick with you. So he says this, and, and that you are Peter. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock. Everybody say rock. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit language on you today because the language really matters. The language that Jesus used here is rock, but there's two different kinds of rock that it, it would be easy for us to miss if we didn't get it. So he uses the word Petros and Petra. See how similar they are? P-E-T-R-O-S, P-E-T-R-A. That's the difference here. He says Peter, which is Petros, you're a rock. That's what Peter's name means. So, so Jesus, is all, he's starting with this play on words, but he's directing this at Peter. And he's saying, I'm telling you that, that you are Peter. Some scholars say, you're, you're little rock. You know, not big rock like Dwayne Johnson. You're little rock. So little rock, Peter. You're little rock. But what it actually means is like a rock by itself. 
Like if you would walk out into the parking lot or you'd go to the beach or whatever, when you find a rock, if you can pick it up, it's this kind of rock. It's a little rock. It's pebble. It's something that's mobile, that is detached. That's what the word is really getting at. It is detached. But Jesus says this, and on this rock, I will build my church. He changes the word. This is where he doesn't say Petros, like Peter. He says Petra. Petra means bedrock. You know what a bedrock is? Bedrock is like when, you, when you're building a skyscraper, you drill down deep into the ground, and you anchor to the bedrock because you can't move that thing. It's solid. It's granite. Or it's marble, like the giant thing in Jesus' background. He, he goes, the bedrock, the foundation, the thing that you can anchor yourselves to, it's on that rock, on that foundation, that I will build my church. What's he talking about there? He's talking about himself. Remember I said every anchor is designed to point to the person of Jesus. Jesus looks at the crowd of his disciples and he goes, I'm the anchor that you've been looking for. All of these other things behind me, all of the Godhead to Caesar and the marble decorations and wealth and prosperity and fame, all of this other thing, or all these other things that is so easy and, and tempting to build your life on, he goes, those are all little tiny rocks. You want to talk bedrock? You want a foundation that will never, never collapse, never fail you? It is me. It's on this foundation that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the, the foundation of the church, but then he keeps going on. The word church is significant uh, because it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean building. It doesn't mean walls. The, the word he actually uses is ecclesia. Ecclesia is significant because it's a gathering of people. It's a group. One scholar said that the way to describe this is called out group. It's saying you, you look at the world, or you can look at a room of people and go, I'm going to talk to this group. This is the called out group. This is the separate group. This is the distinct group. The ecclesia that gathers, they're gathering on the foundation of who Jesus is, but it's not, it's not a building because you can destroy a building. It's a people. It's a group of people that are moving in the same direction, that are built on the foundation of Jesus' core to who they are and why they exist. Jesus is saying, I'm going to gather this group of people, and they're going to be built on the bedrock of who I am. You want to talk about church? That's church. You can't lock that down. You can't destroy that. You could break that up. You could cut it into a tiny pieces. You could send the pieces all over the world, and it will continue to grow and multiply. You can't close it. You can't outlaw it. You can't stop it. Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, hey, little Peter, I'm building my church here, and it's on the bedrock of who I am, and it's going to involve a group of people who understand the same thing and have given their lives to it. And then he says this. This is probably my favorite part. He says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So the gate in ancient times was a place of stronghold for a city. Gates are two ways, right? I, it's just as much to keep things out as it is to keep other things in. Right, if you go to a farm, there's a gate meant to keep animals in. If there's a gate on a military compound, it's meant to keep people out. They, they function differently, but gates have a, a unique purpose. It was often a place of strength. Jesus looks at his church. He looks at his disciples, looks at his people, and he says, the gates of Hades, the stronghold of hell in your house, in your context, in your community, in your school, in your workplace, in your country, in your world, the stronghold where Satan is at his best, where he's destroying the most and causing division and brokenness and pain, where addictions wreak havoc on lives. This place, the gates of Hades, they can't do anything about my church. They can't. They can't stop it. The best that Satan has to offer is nothing in comparison to what Jesus has. Why? Because then he says this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. How do you open a gate? With a key. Jesus is saying, my church is the most important thing you could give your life to. It's the most important. You, you want to talk about seeing my kingdom come here to earth? 
everywhere my kingdom goes, everywhere my people go, when they go in the power of the Spirit, when they're built on the foundation of me as King, as the Son of God, as the Messiah, when my church enters in, gates unlock. The enemy has no power. He has no ability to resist. The, the enemy is overrun by the power of the Holy Spirit-led church. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Revelation, it says this in Revelation chapter 1. John is writing this, the apostle John. And as he's writing, he's, he's describing a picture of Jesus. And here's what he writes. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me. And he said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And then he says this, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. There's Jesus, a picture of what the end looks like. And Jesus, Jesus shows up with a ring of keys. And he goes, I'm here to unlock some stuff. The church that he created, the church that he founded, the church that he started has this. That's why Peter, when Peter gets up and he preaches the gospel, the text says it cut them to the heart because he had some keys. A church led by the Holy Spirit is exciting, exhilarating, powerful, life-changing. It is the most important thing you could ever give your life to on this earth because it's built on the foundation, on the rock, the bedrock of Jesus so question for you. So why are so many people bored in church? Why are so many people bored? If I can pick any moment in all of the Bible, this is probably my number one. Jesus even said to his disciples, it's better for me to leave because of what I have for you. When the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, it's better for you. I'm just going to take him at his word. Because there's a lot of opportunities where you go, man, it'd be pretty cool to watch Jesus do some stuff. It'd be fantastic. But Jesus goes, no, 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 it's better for you that if I'm gone, you get the Holy Spirit because you watch, it takes off like a freight train. You can't stop it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Why are people so bored? The church began like a rocket ship. And most of our experience of church is not a rocket ship. I mean, it's very consumeristic, if I'm being honest with you, especially in our culture, in our context. It's show up and everybody cater to me and my preferences and what I would like and what I want to do and where I want to go and what it, it make me comfortable here in this setting. Maybe it's because of our pursuit of comfort or our pursuit of safety or our pursuit of preferences or, or if we're really being honest, our pursuit of self. Maybe it's because we're actually trying to anchor ourselves to the person of me rather than the person of Jesus, and we're missing out on what Jesus is readily making available to us for the sake of ourselves, our families, our communities, our workplaces, our schools, our, our country, and our world. It's like an oxymoron to me to be bored in the local church. You see, when church is an anchor... When church is the, the, an anchor in your life, simply attending will never be enough. I mentioned our advisory team last week. It's a, a small group of individuals is, that just helped me discern and, and figure out what, 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 what's God doing? What direction is he calling us to? What direction are we moving? We do this together. I mean, it's a biblical model of, of a pastor and, and a group of people that are discerning it together to say, okay, God, we want to follow you. We want to be Holy Spirit-led, just like the early church. Show us what direction. And, and one of them said, it was so good. He goes, man, in our culture, in our context here in West Michigan, it is way easier, it's way easier to build church around my life than it is to build my life around the church. You feel the difference? It's way easier to say, my life is the epicenter, it's the focus, it's the center, it's the most important thing to me, and I build everything around my life, and now I grab the church piece, and I go, where does that fit here? Versus, the church is the most important thing that Jesus called me to. 
to be a part of a group of people that are after the same thing, that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. When church is that nucleus, we build the rest of our lives around it. I don't think you will experience the church that Jesus has intended it to be until it is the focus of your life. I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. Most of my life, I haven't been a pastor. And it's funny, I, if I look at seasons where I, I felt the closest to God and I, I, I got to experience some of his power and some of what he was doing and I saw miracles happen and people get healed and provision that comes through, the most exciting moments that I have of, of somebody that grew up in church, my most boring moments were the places that I simply attended. My most exciting moments, it's kind of like what Carol Ann was talking about when you, when you go... There's a difference between what I have to do and then what I get to do. My most exciting moments in church is when I go, okay, Jesus, I get to do this. I get to be a part. What, what, do, you, what do you want from me? The hardest prayer I've ever prayed. And uh, I, I prayed it a lot for a season, and I went, okay, I'm done praying for that for a season. And then I would come back to it, and then not, and you'll understand why. Because I used to say this, God, I will say whatever it is you want me to say. I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. I'll go wherever it is you want me to go, and I'll give whatever it is you want me to give. Try praying that for a month. And see what happens to your heart. See how God directs your focus and your energy and your time and your money around his church. He gives us an invitation to build on top of the most solid foundation to be a part of the most exciting experience, the most captivating movement of all of history. Jesus invites us to be a part of it. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is the early church, right? This is after all these people give their lives to Christ. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Don't you want to be a part of a church like that? Don't you want to be a part of that movement? It's still alive today. It still exists today. Jesus gives us the invitation. The reason this text is preserved for us is because Jesus continues to go, do you want to come? Do you want to be a part? Do you want to join in? It's the most exciting adventure of your life. Don't settle for anything less. Don't chase anything less. The backdrop of Caesarea Philippi is like the backdrop of our country. Don't settle for the American dream. Don't settle for all of your desires being met. Don't settle for this picture of retirement where you can end your life as comfortable and, and, and set up and supplied as possible. Jesus is saying, I'm offering that to you today. That if you build your life on me, if you stake your finances on me, you stake your calling on me, you stake your context on me, your giftedness on me, your time on me, your family on me, if you build on me, there is no greater foundation that you could ever build your life on. It's an invitation that he gives to us because of his work on the cross. Remember, Jesus had just died and he had just resurrected and his disciples are looking at him saying, I believe you. I've never seen somebody that dead come back to life. And they were dead, dead. Jesus was dead. And they watched him get carried into the tomb. They saw his lifeless body. They saw as they poked him with the spear, they saw the blood and the water come out. They knew Jesus was dead. And when he came out of that grave and he showed them, and he goes, here it is. You want to see the marks? You want to see my side? Here's my feet. It's me. And they went, yep, I can see right through that. That is him. He goes, I'm telling you, I'm building my church. You want to be a part? You want to do it? They couldn't wait to respond. I saw this video not too long ago. 
and uh, I, I can't shake it. I can't forget it. It's a, a video of a man named Wayne Cordero. He's a pastor of a church in Hawaii, and the guy's an excellent communicator, but he describes what his experience was like going to the church in China. This is an older video. It's probably 15 or 18 years old, something like that. And so I wanted to show it to you today, but if you're watching online, a risk that we often have is our stream getting pulled down for copyright infringement. So here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to put a link on your screen so that you can actually click it and watch it later. Uh, but here in the room, we're going to show it. So we, we'll be off for a second but we'll be right back at the end of this video so you can watch with us at the same time. Here's what I want you to see as we watch this video together. How is the church an anchor for these people? Check this out.
Isn't that powerful? The church is an anchor for these people. It's something they've anchored their lives to, their very souls to. They, they haven't built church into their lives. They've built their entire lives around the invitation that they got from Jesus himself to be a part of his local church. What a privilege we have to gather like this. But man, it's my prayer that we would become a church like them. A church that loves the word of God, that gathers together, that sacrifices for one another, that gives more than we need to because we're so moved by the cause that God has called us to, that we give not just to the local church, but we give to missions organizations all over the world. We give to outreach opportunities that exist right here in our city that are specialized in helping specific at-risk or people in needs types of groups. What an invitation that we have to allow the Holy Spirit not just to lead us for an hour on Sundays, but to lead us in our workplaces and in our schools in our neighborhoods, in our families, the Holy Spirit is alive and well. And he deeply desires a church that is anchored to him. I want us to become a church like that. Something that Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed. He had his disciples in a small little room and, and he took the first communion with them which is what we're gonna do today. So if you're watching online, we'd love to have you join too. I mean, you're part of our family just as much as anybody. So if you have some bread or grape juice or wine or anything like that, please, please join in with us. Uh, if you read Acts 2.42, again, it says they all gathered together and they broke bread together. The reason we break bread together is because Jesus looked at his disciples and he stood up in front of them and he broke the bread. He broke it right in front of them. And he says, oh, pay attention. This is my body broken for you. So when you take and eat this, remember me. In the same way he took the cup and the wine and he poured it out. And so they see the wine going into the cup and Jesus says to them, this is my blood which has been poured out for you. It's a new covenant that Jesus was orchestrating right in front of them. He said, when you drink that, I want you to remember me. Friends, as we do this together, we have stations, we have four of them in the back. When we do this, when we partake in communion together, we not only remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, but we remember the family, the called out group, the ecclesia that he has invited us to be a part of. We remember that we exist for a greater purpose than ourselves. And it is the purpose of Jesus who has empowered his church with the Holy Spirit, who has gifted us the keys of the kingdom of heaven to go out into the world, into the darkest places, into the most broken places with the keys that can unlock it. And it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we partake in that together, that's what we remember. And that's what I wanna invite us all to do together right now. So I'd love to pray for us and then let's take communion together. We're not going to do it at the same time. You can take it at your seat whenever you're ready. So God, we just come before you. I just thank you for your church. I love your church, Lord. I really do. Thank you for what it's doing in the world right now. Thank you for the church that, that what we don't see, God, what doesn't get news attention is the church that gathers underground, the church that's ministering to people in need, the church that's ministering right now in war zones in multiple places around the world, the church that's on its knees in prayer, contending for sickness and brokenness and cancer, for the church that is contending for the next generation, God, that they would have their hearts just set on fire by you. God, the, the church that seeks after your Holy Spirit, that seeks after your presence, that, that just like like David, there's nothing we wouldn't give. There's nothing that we wouldn't sacrifice for to just get a taste of closeness and intimacy with you. God, anything that's standing in the way, I just pray that you'd reveal it to us right now. I just thank you for the invite just to follow you, to be a part of your work. God, you know every one of us did not earn it. We earned condemnation. We, we earned the right to be imprisoned by hell forever. And the very keys 
you showed up with unlocked us. We just love you. We are so grateful for you. And as we break bread and drink the cup today, God, we remember the sacrifice that you made for us through Jesus on the cross. We love you with our whole heart. We anchor ourselves to you right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said together.
Amen? Amen. Well, hey, I'd love to invite you. If you want to stand up right now, we'd love to close here at Frontline with a benediction. Uh, it just means blessing. I just want to bless you on your way out. Thanks so much for joining today, too. Uh, this has been a fun series. It's been an impactful series for me personally. So it's just, it's a joy. It's really, it's a joy of mine to get to do this with you. Uh, this is an us thing as we do church. So reminder too, if you're brand new, frontlinejero.com slash new or stop at our uh, visitor tent outside. We, we just love to meet with you and connect with you. Uh, so don't, don't miss an opportunity to connect. So uh, we love to ask people to do this, just to extend their hands like this. It's a posture of reception. Like I, w- I want to receive this, uh, to receive the blessing that I have for you today. So brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, uh, leave as part of the church. The ecclesia, built on the bedrock of the person of Jesus with the keys of the kingdom of heaven that can unlock the gates of Hades in your context, in your life, in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your communities. Jesus has gifted you with the powerful Holy Spirit who will lead you, guide you, protect you, and empower you to do what he has called you to do in your context. Go in peace and in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. Love you a lot. We'll see you next week as we close out of this series.